sharing that. I love that you have pivoted from just the conventional care of certain recommendations. And I'm guessing that you probably don't recommend people to stop eating meat. So my guess is that you don't think cholesterol is bad, or maybe there's context to that. But why do we think that for heart health, we should stop eating cholesterol and saturated fats? Yeah, this is really a, uh, a complicated, convoluted story. And, you know, it's interesting when you really look at the scientific literature, there's no reason that we should believe that. There really is the evidence does not support that conclusion. And this has now been shown in multiple large, you know, what we call meta-analyses and, you know, interventional trials. And it was really just poor science, honestly combined with almost a religious pursuit of this idea that got us here in the first place. Many people are probably familiar with the story of, you know, Ansel Keys, who was really the first scientist that strongly promoted this idea that saturated fat in the diet was was causing the epidemic of heart disease that we were seeing in this country in the 1950s. This really reached a crisis point in 1955 when President Eisenhower, while in office, had a heart attack. And that appropriately set off the alarm bells. And Ansel Keys, who was kind of a fledgling scientist at the time, you know, just really promoted this hypothesis about saturated fat and blamed you know, President Eisenhower's heart disease on saturated fat, despite the fact that President Eisenhower was a heavy smoker, and that was sort of the obvious cause for his heart disease. And then, you know, he set off on a scientific mission to prove his hypothesis. And really, when you look at the work that he did, he didn't really stick well to the scientific method, we'll, we'll say, but he was able to gain a lot of political power and really, you know, use some sort of heavy-handed techniques to quash any anyone who questioned his hypothesis. And, you know, from there, basically, industry got involved, the food industry got involved, and then the pharmaceutical industry got involved. And, you know, when I went through medical school in the 1990s, you know, early to mid-1990s, it was an unquestioned fact. It was not presented to me as hypothesis. It was presented to me as fact, as cholesterol is the cause of heart disease. And the primary way that we can manage heart disease is by managing cholesterol levels. And of course, you know, I and many others have now come to discover that that's not really the whole story. And then in medical school, do they teach like, so if I went to medical school, medical school today, would the same narrative be continued? So would they still say to me to reduce heart disease, I would have to reduce my cholesterol levels? Yeah, most definitely. And that's what all of our practice guidelines are centered on. And, you know, I want people to understand that it's not that I'm saying that cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease. It's just that cholesterol shouldn't be our primary focus when it comes to heart disease. And a blanket lowering of cholesterol levels isn't really what we need. When I talk about cholesterol, it's in the context of our cholesterol quality matters. It's not really our cholesterol quantity that matters. Okay. So then if I were to work with you and you were my heart doctor, what would you look at in my life or maybe diet or, you know, any other thing in part of me to make sure that I have good heart health? Yeah. So, you know, the first thing that I think, you know, where my messaging might differ and the first thing that I do differently in practice than much of the cardiology community is, you know, blood work is okay. And it gives us some indications, but it really doesn't tell us, do you have heart disease or not? And so one thing that I emphasize to people is if you want to know if you have heart disease, let's get a test that actually looks at whether or not you have heart disease, not risk factors for heart disease. So the test that I advocate for strongly and use liberally with my patients is what's called a coronary artery calcium scan. And this is a type of imaging study, a type of CAT scan that actually looks at the arteries of the heart 
and looks for evidence of plaque in those arteries, specifically calcified plaque. So that's that's really step number one. And then, you know, the primary risk factor for heart disease from a dietary standpoint or, or sort of from a physiologic standpoint, I'll say, is insulin resistance. And so the main thing that I'm looking for is insulin resistance. And we can certainly get into why insulin resistance is so important, but study after study, really every study that I have ever looked at that compares insulin resistance to cholesterol levels in terms of their magnitude of risk for heart disease, it's not even close. Insulin resistance is five to 10 times more important, more powerful a predictor of heart disease risk than cholesterol levels are. The CAC score, the coronary artery calcium score, most people want the zero. And then zero is like, okay, cool, I'm safe, I have good heart health. But then some people yep. will get the test and maybe they have some numbers. Because some people will say to me, I have a calcium score of 100, and so therefore I shouldn't go carnivore because I already have plaque and I'm really scared and my doctor is scaring me that if I eat more cholesterol, it's gonna worsen it, so what should I do? What should they do in that instance? Yeah. So if you have a non-zero score, the goal is you want that score not to get worse over time. And again, you know, cholesterol and a low fat, low cholesterol diet is not the answer. It doesn't work. We have plenty of data showing us this, but controlling insulin resistance is what you should be focused on. And the best way we have to control insulin resistance is a low carbohydrate dietary approach. And that includes a carnivore approach. And really, again, there's no reason that we should be fearing red meat or cholesterol in the diet. Red meat has now, again, clearly been shown not to be a risk factor for the development of heart disease. Red meat by itself, I'm going to say. Red meat as part of a Western diet has been implicated in heart disease and many other disease processes. But again, it's not the red meat itself. It's what people are eating with the red meat, the French fries, the soda, the toppings, the bun. That's the real problem. It's not, and it's never been the red meat itself. So we don't run a lot of scores because, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but we'll see people have the score, but we all, we see a lot of insulin markers have you seen that if a certain person has a insulin resist or an insulin marker of over a certain number that there's a higher chance of the there being a plaque in their arteries? Yes, we, uh, you know, insulin resistance, and there are a number of ways that you can look at that from a laboratory standpoint is clearly associated with not only the presence of disease, but the progression of disease. And again, no matter what your score is might be today, if you stop it from getting worse, that's going to put you in a, you know, a better place. So I look at various markers of insulin sensitivity. You know, you can start with if all you have is a basic lipid panel to look at, for instance, with which some patients are limited to for whatever reason, just look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. And you want that to be less than 1.5. Anything over two for that ratio means that you're likely to be insulin resistant. Now, ideally, you're going to get better markers of insulin resistance. So this starts with a fasting insulin level. And if you have your fasting insulin and your fasting glucose level, you can calculate what's called the HOMA IR score. And you can, you know, there are numerous calculators online that you can just plug in your insulin and your glucose values. And again, it, you know, a HOMA IR score of greater than two is an indicator that you're insulin resistant. If you can take it to the next step, even better is what's called a lipoprotein insulin resistance score, LPIR score. And what this score does is it looks at the size of your cholesterol particles. And I mentioned earlier in the talk how important cholesterol quality is. And it turns out that insulin resistance is the primary in influencer of the quality of our cholesterol particles. So Dr. Bill Cromwell was really the one that pioneered this. And he was smart enough to figure out that you can work in reverse. 
You can look at the size of people's cholesterol particles and use that to determine if they are insulin resistant because that relationship is so strong. And so the LPIR score, I think is the best practical way for us to measure insulin resistance. And I'll mention kind of what the gold standard way of diagnosing insulin resistance is. It's what's called a craft test, but it's kind of an impractical test to do. You basically have to drink a solution of sugar, of glucose, and then you have to measure both your insulin and your glucose levels every half hour for three hours afterwards to really, you know, figure out a craft, a proper craft test. So that becomes a little impractical to do. And I think today, if, you know, what the best lab test is for insulin resistance is the LPIR score. So what's so interesting is occasionally we will run a more comprehensive cholesterol panel that has the NMR graph with all the different size particles. Mm -hmm. And what we find is in that the LPIR is a little bit closer to more insulin resistant, but their fasting insulin is normal. So then we were always like, what does that mean? So it looks like you have the answer to that. Yeah. And really, you know, again, Dr. Kraft, uh, Joseph Kraft figured this out because when you look at the Kraft patterns, so there are five patterns that you can get on a Kraft test. And, you know, two of the patterns that define insulin resistance, you actually start with a normal fasting insulin. So having a normal fasting insulin level doesn't guarantee that you're insulin resistant, that you're not insulin resistant. Now, if your fasting insulin level is elevated, that does show you that you're insulin resistant, but you can have a normal fasting insulin level and still be insulin resistant, you know, when you do a full craft test or now, like you said, the LPIR score will reveal that as well. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense because we tend to see the fasting insulin because someone's carnivore, they've been eating this way for a while. So now their fasting insulin has come down and we were always perplexed with, well, that's interesting because their PIR score shows that they're still insulin resistant. So I guess that is more of a, maybe a better marker to look at long-term. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, again, you can then correlate this with things like visceral fat levels, which are, you know, very strongly associated with insulin resistance. And, you know, oftentimes I'm kind of putting all of these things together. You know, I always tell people, understand that there's no one test that tells you, am I healthy or not? And that's kind of the fallacy of the well, let's just look at your LDL cholesterol and that's going to tell us everything we need to know about heart disease. I mean, it really is nonsensical. You know, heart disease is such a complex process to think that one lab test is going to tell us everything we need to know. It, it really was a, a, you know, just a silly concept to start with. Yet here we are and most doctors firmly still believe that, you know, just look at the LDL cholesterol and you're going to be able to tell if someone's at risk of heart disease or not. Right. And it's so unfortunate because we see people turn carnivore. They're like, oh my gosh, all my symptoms are better. I'm sleeping through the night. I'm losing weight. I feel so much better. And then they go and do their blood work next to their total cholesterol or their LDL cholesterol. It says H. And they're like, my doctor says I need to get on a statin now and I need to change my diet. And even though a lot of their symptoms have improved, now they are so worried that they need to get on medication. You talked yeah, a little... that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that really is unfortunate. And especially people who have, you know, very strong reasons for, you know, needing to do a carnivore diet. You know, right. for instance, they have severe autoimmune conditions that are really being benefited by this dietary approach. And they're, they're basically scared out of it by their doctors who don't understand you know, what this number means or doesn't mean. Right, right. Agreed. Totally agreed. So there, it sounds like some cholesterol may not be as ideal. Can you talk through a little bit about what do you mean by the quality of cholesterol? Yeah. So, you know, when we look at, you know, our blood cholesterol measurements, HDL, LDL are the ones that people are going to be familiar with. And, you know, we're told that HDL is good cholesterol and LDL is bad cholesterol. And again, that really, it, you know, that concept is very flawed. Both HDL and LDL represent families of 
cholesterol carrying particles in the bloodstream. And, you know, we can, one of the ways to sort of further break down our cholesterol particles is by their size. And specifically, when we look at LDL cholesterol, this is most relevant for, we know that the, there are small, dense LDL particles, and there are large, buoyant or large, fluffy LDL particles. And furthermore, what we know is that it is only the small, dense particles that end up in atherosclerotic plaques. The large, fluffy, large, buoyant particles do not get involved, incorporated into atherosclerotic plaques. So this is the problem with just looking at the LDL level as an overall level. We don't know, you know, is it high because you have a lot of large, fluffy particles, which I would put forth as not a problematic situation. And even if your LDL level is what's considered low, you know, in the target range, if you have a low amount of LDL cholesterol, but most of that LDL is small, dense particles, you are still at risk of heart disease. And this is why I see people ending up on my operating table, despite the fact that they've had low you know, well-controlled in the guidelines, LDL cholesterol levels for decades in many cases, and yet they still end up with heart disease. They still end up on my operating table. Some people say that certain genetic types, so I think I think it might've been the APOE gene, but they mm -hmm. cannot, they're not as, they're not able to tolerate as much saturated fat. Have you seen that in your practice with heart health? Well, you know, I, I think that, concept is flawed as well, honestly. And we're still really trying to figure out, you know, what APOE genetics mean. Um, you know, the biggest concern around them has been that APO, if you have what's called a double APOE4, that, you know, you're at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, increased risk for heart disease. And that, you know, that's been, it, it's been put forth that you're in some way, you know, abnormally susceptible to saturated fat. But if we step back, it really doesn't make sense for that to be the case. Because we have to realize that, you know, these genetic types, you know, have, have been selected for over, you know, millennia over our existence as human beings. Um, you know, genetics don't really change quickly across a population. So APOE4, would have survived in the population at a time when humans were eating primarily saturated fat. Because for most of our existence as human beings, we ate primarily saturated fat. And so, you know, I do have a number of patients that do have, you know, the double four, APOE4, and they're, they're doing these diets and we're monitoring them closely and they don't seem to be, you know, developing accelerated heart disease in my experience thus far. So I don't think, you know, it's really the whole story as we, you know, as we've told, been told that it is.